So uh, if you've got a 15-year-old at home, they're probably not listening to you about the environment. <laughs> they're probably learning much more uh, in school. And so that is one of the reasons we need to be much more um, conscious about teaching students about environmental issues and about green chemistry and sustainability while they're in class, because that's the primary source of information. I wanted to mention another report um, that has outlined some of the issues in sustainability for the chemical industry going forward. And this is from the National Research Council, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. And this report identified eight grand challenges that the chemical industry faces in terms of sustainability. But in addition to identifying these challenges, they also identified specific research needs to provide some guidance to chemists and chemical engineers in terms of developing processes and products that are going to be better and more sustainable. So these are the list of eight. I'm going to spend most of my time on the last one, sustainability science literacy. But I'm going to give you a few examples from the other ones so you have a sense of what um, they're talking about and to give you a better sense of, of green chemistry. Yes, chemical structures. <laughs> Very exciting. OK. Hopefully no one runs from the room screaming when you see this. <laughs> so chemical transformations. You know, think about the chemistry we've been doing for the last 50, 150 uh, years. Much of it was developed in a time when there was no awareness of the impact on the environment. So what did we do? We used really hazardous materials, you know, really strong reagents, lots of heat, lots of pressure, and we could just about make anything. Um, some people call it heat, beat, and treat. <laughs> you heat it up, you beat it to death, and then you treat the waste when you're done. OK, not a good approach. So we really need to come up with ways to make the same products in a way that's better for the environment. And there have been a lot of good examples from the pharmaceutical industry. And part of that is because think about how you make pharmaceuticals. You don't just throw everything to a sink, into a flask, stir it up, and your pure product jumps out at the end, you know, ready to go. Um, you've got multiple steps. You've got the need for high purity because it's going into somebody's body. It's a pharmaceutical. So there's a lot of solvent usage. I mean, all sorts of problems. So there's lots of room for improvement in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is one of my favorite examples. So this is for the um, synthesis of sertraline which is shown here. This is the active ingredient in Zoloft, which is a drug that's used to treat depression. So the top scheme shows the old way of doing it. And, and the key step was that first one, where they're using titanium tetrachloride. Um, they're using a whole host of solvents. Uh, it was creating a lot of waste. And it wasn't very efficient. So when Pfizer decided to redesign the synthesis of sertraline. They were able to increase the yield by, they, they were actually able to double the yield on this one. So what does doubling the yield mean for a pharmaceutical company? That means more money for the pharmaceutical company. Green is not just the color of chemistry. It's the color of money, at least in the United States. <laughs> I know that varies around the world. Industry adopts green chemistry when it makes money for them. And so that's what we really need to focus on, are technologies that are going to be adopted by industry, because that's where it's going to make a difference, is if industry adopts them because of the huge scale at which they operate, it's going to have an impact on the environment. So the big thing that Pfizer did when they redesigned the synthesis was change that whole mix of solvents up there down to a single solvent, ethanol. And by doing that, they were able to eliminate the use of titanium tetrachloride, which eliminated the generation of 440 tons of titanium um, dioxide mixed waste. They also were able to get rid of about 140 tons of sodium hydroxide. Because of that, they were able to eliminate about 100 tons of hydrochloric acid. I mean, it adds up to about 700 tons of material that they were able to eliminate by redesigning this. Also notice in the second step here, where they reduced the imine to the amine, they came up with a more effective catalyst. So that's a more efficient step. 
And then these two are not isolated anymore. And if you're not isolating them, then you also eliminate all of that extra solvent and energy. So it's a much more efficient process that makes more money for Pfizer. So that's a good thing, and less waste for the environment. So that's one example of a chemical transformation that is greener. Second pharmaceutical example is uh, acidic liptin, which is from Merck. This is used to uh, treat type 2 diabetes and has very few side effects. You probably hear in the United States, we eat too much, we exercise too little, we're all getting very heavy. More and more people have diabetes. Um, and so they are, need to come up, because we're not getting off the couch and exercising. Um, they need to come up with more and better drugs that are going to treat the diabetes and have fewer side effects. And so citagliptin is the active ingredient in Genuvia, which is one of the big drugs used to treat type 2 diabetes. And when, they, when Merck and Codexis came up with a new way of doing this, what they came up with, with is a transaminase-based process to convert the ketone to the chiralamine. So you can see the chiralamine center right here. What's nice about this is it's not a reaction that is specific to this synthesis. It has broad application, so it can be used in a lot of other processes as well. The benefits that were realized are shown here. Going from the first generation, it was eight steps to make that drug, 44% overall yield. By redesigning, the eight steps have been cut down to only three steps now, 50% increase in overall yield, and 22,000 kilograms less waste per thousand kilograms of product. That's a huge decrease in waste. And again, if the company doesn't have to treat or dispose of the waste, they're going to save money again. And so it's very attractive to them. So there's some real benefits to coming up with better chemical transformations. Life cycle tools was the second challenge that was noticed. Life cycle assessment, you know, really looking at your process from start to finish. Um, what, what are the energy impacts that go into even making your starting material? Where does it come from? What do you use during the synthesis? What happens to the final product at the end? People, some people call it uh, cradle to grave. Other people call it cradle to cradle. So that instead of grave where it's being put in the ground, you then reuse it in some manner. And so these are just some of the things you need to look at when you're trying to figure out what the impact of your process is. And there's a lot of them, and this is not a full list. It's, again, something that should be part of our education. Engineers tend to do this much, much more so than chemists do. And we need to really get the engineers and chemists talking to each other so that we can have a better understanding of life cycle. Toxicological fate and effect. We need to know what happens to chemicals once they get out into the environment. How do they interact with humans? How do they interact with, uh, in the water? How do they break down? If they get into a living organism, what, what happens to them? What metabolic pathways do they follow? Do they break down into more hazardous substances in the a body that cause problems? These are all questions we have very little data on. And we really need to have much more using things like computational toxicology. We need better data sets so we have a better understanding of the impacts of the chemicals that we're using and making. Chemicals from biomass. Again, this is something that Brazil is, is, is famous for, as well as fuels from biomass. This example was from a small company in Massachusetts in the United States that took waste biomass. We don't want to be using food crops. You know, in the US, we like to turn corn into ethanol. That's not very smart, because that corn we need to feed humans as well as uh, animals. And so we need to look for other options. So here they take things, paper mill uh, waste, you know, sludge from um, waste treatment plants, and they convert it into levolinic acid. And you can see then that that waste can become a whole host of useful chemicals. And so keep in mind that waste is only waste because we haven't figured out something better to do with it. And if we start thinking about things not as waste, but can it be a starting material for something else? Or can it be used elsewhere? Then we're going to eliminate a lot more of the waste. And that's more of that cradle to cradle uh, idea. Fuels from renewable resources. I won't even spend time on this one, because you all know about pr producing biodiesel and other fuels for, from renewable resources. And biodiesel, I know, is much bigger here than it is in the United States. But we're moving a little more in that direction. 
Um, energy efficient technologies. Um, this example shows um, a, a new synthesis for propylene oxide, which is one of the top 50 chemicals produced in the world. And previous syntheses of uh, propylene oxide used uh, a lot of energy, um, a lot of hazardous chemicals, produced a lot of waste. And so this new process by Dow and BASF uses hydrogen peroxide. The only co-product there is water. It uses 35% less en energy. And again, the catalysis is a very important part of this um, because that catalyst allows this transformation to take place. Another example, so this is a really um, cool example that received the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in the US this year. So when you convert bauxite ore to alumina, there's sort of a, a classic or standard process that's called the Bayer um, process. And in this process, the problem that occurs is you get these crystals. It's called sodalite is sort of the common name for it, but they're uh, aluminosilicate crystals that beat up, uh, build up in the heat exchanger in the pipe. And of course, when you think about something building up, it'd be like you know plaque building up in your arteries. Things don't work so well. You get decreased efficiency, uh, the heat exchange isn't as efficient, and then to clean it out, you've got to use sulfuric acid, which is pretty corrosive. And so what Cytec, a company, came up with is this, and of course they don't tell us the ingredients, it's proprietary, but they call it Max HT. Um, and this inhibits crystal formation. But by at using this in this process of turning bauxite ore into alumina, the annual savings are huge depending on the size of the plant. Anywhere from two to twenty million dollars a year and nine and a half to forty seven and a half trillion BTUs. So that's a really great example of how you can reduce the energies and have a much more efficient process. And it's, it's not that it's the process itself, but it's inhibiting the buildup of this scale. So that's really more of an engineering issue with a chemistry solution to it by coming up with something that, you know, just really basically stops the scale from building up on the pipes and the heat exchangers. So that's a really cool technology, I think. CO2 management, that's huge. I mean, we, we are talking more and more about renewables. We still use renewables globally. It's a tiny fraction of our, our um, energy sources. What are we still using? Fossil fuels. You know, as long as we're using fossil fuels, we'll continue to produce large quantities of carbon dioxide. We know, you know, the scientific data show this. CO2 concentrations are increasing. Temperatures are increasing. But we know as scientists that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. However, is, is one causing the other? Is the increased CO2 causing global climate change? And the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says this is very likely uh, because of the trends that have seen and because of the data in all sorts of areas from atmospheric um, readings to ice core samples, and it's just a trend that we're, we're seeing. And the issue is if we wait around to see if this is caused by humans, it's going to take a very, even now, it's going to take a very long time to really reverse things. And so we are seeing consequences with the, the warming temperatures. In, in Washington, we just had, I think, the, high, the hottest July on record. Um, it was very toasty this summer. So it's, and it's not going to be all parts of the globe. Some places will get warmer, some will get cooler, some will get drier. We're also in a drought. Some will, will get more rain. So it's going to be uneven, but, but change is happening and it's pretty well documented. And so one of the things that we need to think about is as long as we're burning fossil fuels, how do we capture that CO2 and how do we store it someplace so it's not going to be contributing to climate change? Thank you.